Good afternoon. Uh, I'm David Rosenthal, and uh, I'm here to talk about the really big problem in uh, digital preservation, which is money. So uh, <clears throat> this all started, as you'll see, a year ago, um, and has been developing into quite a conversation in uh, uh, various conferences and blogs and so on. Um, but the way I'm going to structure things this afternoon is I'm going to talk about the various business models for long-term storage and uh, the likely effect of uh, future technologies on them. And this is going to point up the fact that we need uh, economic models of long-term storage to compare costs through time and uh, make comparisons between different storage technologies. And then I'm going to be talking uh, about the economic model that I've been building over the last few months. And I'm going to be asking, I'm going to be showing you some of the things that it can do and asking what you want an economic model like this to do because we're in the process of ramping up a significant effort between uh, me and uh, UC Santa Cruz and um, SUNY Stony Brook and so on to work on this. So everything you're seeing today is either me arguing about stuff or this is very much work in progress. So I'm sure you've all seen this uh, amazing graph, which is Crider's Law. It's graphing the um, decrease in cost per byte of storage on disks over the past 30 years, and it's been dropping exponentially. And uh, this has led people to think of three basic business models for storing data. There's renting the space. Amazon's S3 is, a, a, uh, is an example of, rent, of the rental model. Uh, you can monetize the content. If you think about why Google is able to store your Gmail, it's because it sells adverts on accesses to the, uh, the mail. And in, in effect, think about how, uh, how often you access your really old mail. Not very often. So how much money is Google making over storing you, the, the back content of your mail archive? It's not making very much, which is the reason why Google limits the amount of mail that you can store and modulates the rate at which they increase the amount of mail that you can store to make sure that they make enough money out of your access to your recent mail to continue to pay for your old mail. And the remaining one is endowing the data. In other words, you deposit the data with a sum of money which is supposed to be adequate to pay for its preservation forever. Uh, and last year at this meeting, um, Serge Goldstein of Princeton explained their um, data space service, which is actually running this model. And I stole a couple of his slides in which he explained the reason why he thought it worked. Uh, so what he's really saying here is that providing the uh, costs of storage continue to decrease at the same rate that they have historically, that uh, if you charge twice the initial cost of storage, you can store it forever. Now, um, in the question and answer session, I was somewhat skeptical about this, and our discussion continued. Uh, but there's no question that endowment, of these three models, endowment is the one that we should try and make work if we possibly can. And the reason is that rental is in inherently it's sort of immune from whether the, disc, the cost of storage continues to drop or not. If the cost of storage doesn't drop, then the rental doesn't drop. Uh, monetizing it doesn't really work for preserved content because, let's face it, nobody ever accesses the stuff, or at least nobody that you'd be interested in selling ads to. Uh, so endowment is the one that we need to make work. And for things like um, NSF data management plans, the ability to roll up the long-term cost of storage into the project funding is kind of essential because there is no 
continuing flow of funds into the future that you can count on to pay for the storage. And uh, stored data is unlike paper. It doesn't survive benign neglect. It's very vulnerable to, to interruptions in the money supply. So we should want to make endowment work, but I was a bit skeptical about the idea of charging double uh, the storage cost, um, which is, of course, I was right to be skeptical about that because actually Surge is charging 30 times the cost of storage. Uh, so what are the assumptions behind this model, that the, this simplistic model that Surge was presenting? Well, the first one is that storage is the major cost of preservation. Uh, and or storage media, the, 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 the stuff that's dropping 20% a year is a major cost. Uh, then there's the assumption that Crider's law will continue at least for a decade or so. After that, the exponential has gotten small enough that it doesn't really matter whether it continues very much. And the third one is that the service will give you in the future what you paid for in the past. Now let's look at each of these. Um, these are numbers from Vijay Gill at Google showing that um, space, power, and cooling are about 60% of the total cost of owning a server in one of Google's uh, farms. And this sort of chimes with numbers from the San Diego Supercomputer Center, which has been tracking storage costs over a long period of time. And uh, their numbers suggest that media cost is about a third of the total. So if and only if all the other costs like space, power, and cooling, and so on, uh, go with effectively the number of disks and not the size of the data that you're storing, then um, Surge is right. Stor storage is, in effect, the, the major part of um, the preservation costs. Um, but if they don't, then instead of dropping 20% a year, you're dropping a third of 20% a year, 7% a year, and the numbers look much worse. So this is another graph that I'm sure you've seen. This is Moore's Law, uh, which has been going for 40 years, not 30 years. Um, and it looks like it'll keep going forever. Uh, but keeping exponentials going forever is kind of hard. And this is what's actually been happening to CPUs. Uh, a few years ago, Moore's Law continued to deliver more and more transistors per chip, but more and more transistors per chip stopped delivering faster and faster CPUs because they ran into all sorts of interesting problems about heat dissipation and distributing the clock around the chip and so on. And they also ran into business issues, which were that there were things that people thought were a lot, worth, a lot more worth paying money for than faster CPUs, such as CPUs that burnt less power. Um, so that even if the underlying exponential continues, it may not continue to deliver what you think of as what it's been delivering in the past. So you think that Crider's law is about dollars per byte, but actually it's about the size of a bit on the surface of the, the disk. And there are a lot of good reasons for believing that Crider's law is in trouble. Uh, one of them is that the desktop PC market is going away. Netbooks and now tablets are destroying the market for uh, desktop PCs, which is destroying the market for three and a half inch disk drives. You can't fit a three and a half inch disk drive into a laptop. Um, so there are going to be much smaller volumes for, three and a, for consumer three and a half inch drives, which are the drives which big storage farms are mostly built out of. And the next one is that the uh, the curve has actually stopped. Um, we're just barely getting three terabyte drives now. If we'd stayed on the curve, we should have got four terabyte drives almost a year ago. And the reason is that there have been five generations of the technology underlying um, current disk drives, which is called perpendicular magnetic recording. 
uh, the anticipated industry roadmap was we, we would have switched to one of the successor technologies about now. Uh, the successors that people are talking about are heat-assisted magnetic recording and bit pattern media. Unfortunately, the transition to both of these have turned out to be enormously more difficult and expensive than anybody anticipated. And so there's a desperate struggle right now to stretch the existing technology for another generation. And to give you some idea about how desperate this is, the way that they're proposing to do it is called shingled rights. Shingled rights sound pretty innocuous, but what that actually means is moving the tracks on the disk close enough together that writing one track will affect the tracks alongside it. <laughs> and using extremely sophisticated digital signal processing technology to uh, unmix the tracks when you read them. <laughs> You wouldn't do this if uh, you weren't desperate. Um, so this is, this is a graph from Dave Anderson at Seagate, who is one of, the, uh, one of my favorite people in the storage industry, showing um, the, the, uh, the progress of, of this technology towards this line at the top, which says single particle superparamagnetic super limit estimated. Uh, this, that line is where the bits on the disk can't get any smaller because the um, magnet magnetization of grains that small becomes unstable. And they don't know exactly where it is, but we're clearly going to run into it sometime between about 2019 and 2026. And in the meantime, we have to get into these various uh, uh, new technologies, which are going to be very expensive. And then there's the whole question of whether you're actually going to get what you paid for when you pay up front for storage. If you think about this, this is like the insurance industry, right? You pay up front, and then something happens, and you collect money in the future. Uh, and there are good reasons why the insurance industry is very, very heavily regulated by governments, because the temptation is to take your money and run. <laughs> and you basically have no leverage. You've paid the money, they've got your money, and, and now you claim because, you know, um, you have some medical condition. And they say, well, I'm sorry, that's not covered. <laughs> so you need some kind of escrow service which regularly audits the storage service that you're paying for and dis discovers whether it's actually preserving the data. Um, and if the service stops doing it, transfers the data to a successor. Well, the problem with that is, with all these storage services, it actually costs money to get the data out. And it costs money to put the data into the new service. So you need to have reserves to cover the transfer of data from one service to another, and then there's the problem that these transfers actually take a long time. You know, if you've got a few hundred gigabytes in one of these storage servers, you can't just press a button and instantly transfer that to some other service. And so you discover that the service is failing, and, well, rather, your escrow service discovers that the service is failing and initiates the transfer, and now it's a race between you, your transfer succeeding, and the underlying storage service going out of business. <laughs> OK, so supposing you set up a trust uh, to buy cloud storage forever, uh, and it's using S3. If it's using the 4.9 service, you're going to have to deposit, and, and we're assuming 25% per year decrease in, in Amazon's um, rates for storing which hasn't actually happened. Uh, but let's assume that it had. Uh, you would have to deposit $4,700 for every terabyte. If you were using the 11.9 service, you'd have to deposit $7,000 per terabyte. Well, long-term storage of, say, a petabyte of stuff needs vastly more than 11.9s of reliability. Um, so 
Google isn't charging enough to provide the level of reliability you need for long-term storage. So clearly, since Princeton's charging less than either of these two, and Princeton's economics are unlikely to be any better than Google's, Princeton isn't charging enough. And what this means is we have a serious marketing problem, because now you have to go to the people who have the data that you want to preserve and say, you need to give me 70 times as much as the cost of the disk to hold your storage in order to keep it for the long haul, which is a pretty unconvincing story. OK, so future technologies. There's a wonderful paper by Mark Kreider of Kreider's Law and colleagues at, at Carnegie Mellon called After Hard Disks, What Comes Next? Which is a pretty, you've got to admit, it's a pretty hot topic right now because of flash storage and so on. Um, and they assume that Kreider's Law continues at least through 2020. And that means that, you, that in 2020, you should be able to get a 14 terabyte, two and a half inch drive for $40, which sounds great. Except, do you actually want a 14 terabyte, two and a half inch drive? Think about backing up 14 terabytes of data out of your laptop. Um, how exactly are you going to do that? Uh, <laughs> so what's going to happen is you're not going to get a 14 terabyte, two and a half inch drive for 40 bucks. Um, you're much more likely to get something like a, a six terabyte, one inch drive for uh, about 30 bucks. Um, and the other thing they point out is you know, what I showed you on, on um, Dave Anderson's graph, that the curve stops by 2026. And so they look at 14 different solid state um, storage technologies to see how well they're going to manage to compete with hard drives. And it's pretty depressing uh, because the uh, solid state storage is all built on, on um, semiconductor fabs. And semiconductor fabs take a long time to build. And so there's this roadmap which the industry is working on, which tells you how well they're going to be doing each year out into the future. And you can tell that in 2020, um, roughly speaking, how small a, 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 a storage cell you can build in each of these technologies. So you can tell how dense you're going to be able to get with them. And um, it's not very competitive with a 14 terabyte, two and a half inch disk drive. So will solid state take over? Um, we can definitely say, no, it won't, because uh, the storage technologies that are going to be in the market in 2020 um, have to, the, the <laughs> you have to start building the fabs to, to make them um, in the next couple of years. And uh, so the people in the uh, companies that build the equipment that goes into these fabs um, need to be working on it about now. And uh, so we know, roughly speaking, uh, how many wafers full of chips are going to be going through fabs in, in the years running up to 2020. And we know roughly how much storage you can put on each, each wafer. And the answer is you can't build enough wafers to displace the whole market for disk drives. So solid state memory and hard drives will share the market the way they actually share them now. I mean, I look around, there are a lot of iPads and iPhones and things like that, and they don't have hard drives in them because even though solid, uh, flash memory is more expensive than hard drives, it has other attributes like not breaking when you drop it uh, that mean that it's more valuable in, and it's worth putting it into um, tablets and iPhones and digital cameras and things like that. So the question is, which segments favor which technology? And from our point of view, the question is, uh, can you use solid state memory for long-term storage? Well, it's much more expensive to buy but it's much cheaper to run, and it has much longer service life. And so as we saw earlier, um, running costs are about two-thirds of the total cost of long-term storage. So it's arguable that it makes sense to use um, 
even flash memory for uh, long-term storage. And um, Ian Adams, Ethan Miller, and I wrote a paper at uh, UC Santa Cruz laying out a, an architecture for uh, how to use um, flash memory for long-term archival storage and uh, arguing on the basis of a rather simplistic economic analysis that actually um, it was pretty competitive. But reading the paper after I'd written it uh, and, um, and thinking about it, it was obvious that this level of economic analysis was about as sophisticated as Serge Goldstein's. And um, it wasn't enough. I mean, everybody can understand that if you have an unlimited number of dollars, it's easy to keep data forever. So you're going to have to make trade-offs of how much you're going to spend against how much reliability you're going to get. And how do we make good trade-off decisions? Because money is critical, and so making good decisions in this area is important. So we need quantitative models of reliability. And I've already written and spoken quite a lot about how hard it is to build quantitative models of how reliable storage is. So the next thing to do was to look at the other half of the equation and say, well, can we build um, cost models? And it turns out that these cost models are quite hard too. Uh, because um, storage for the long term is not a one-off decision. It's, uh, the, the life of the data is much longer than the life of any of the hardware systems you're going to use to store it. And the service life of different technologies varies through time. And uh, systems and the media and so on have different purchase costs and they have different running costs, which also vary through time. And uh, the interest rates you need to pay in order to finance the purchase of the hardware vary through time. And so at each stage of the life of some data, you have a decision to take, which is fundamentally whether you're going to continue to use the storage that's currently storing it or whether you're going to replace it with newer technology. And if you're going to replace it, what are you going to replace it with? And so you need to take this decision every year or so. And um, in particular, what I ran into is that I'd been working for the Library of Congress on the question of using cloud storage uh, to, as, as the storage back end for uh, LOX systems. And I'd gotten some versions of what LOX in the cloud means working, and the others should work shortly. But as I started thinking about this, it was obvious that the question people were going to ask me when I was done was, does it make economic sense to use cloud storage instead of local storage uh, for, for my LOX box? Um, and this is an apples versus oranges comparison, because local storage has capital costs and running costs, and cloud storage has effectively only running costs. Um, and somehow, you need to compare these two on a, on a rational basis. And the rational basis, as you'll find in all the economics textbooks, is something called discounted cash flow, uh, which is a way of comparing costs now with costs in the future. So you assume an interest rate, and you invest some money at the, at the assumed interest rate so that when you need the money, uh, the, the principal plus the interest that you've accumulated over that time equals the cost that you're going to have to pay. And the amount that you invest now is called the net present value of the future cost. And then obviously the question is, what interest rates do I use? Well, if you're absolutely certain about the uh, future cost, you can use the uh, treasury bond rates, because every day the U.S. Treasury publishes the, the, um, the yield curve for inflation-protected uh, U.S. Treasury bonds, which connects the, the um, term of a loan to the uh, risk-free inflation-protected interest rate. Uh, now, obviously, you're, in practice, you're less certain about the 
future costs than the US Treasury is. Um, so you have a risk premium added to the interest rate, which you can sort of adjust to account for how uncertain you really are. And this is the standard technique that all investors use to assess the return on future investments or future costs that companies are going to incur and um, what could possibly go wrong, right? We know how good these guys are at uh, their job. Well, um, here is some research from the Bank of England. Uh, Andrew Haldane and Davis looked at the history of hundreds and hundreds of companies' uh, stock prices and uh, their actual earnings. And what they found was that investors were systematically using discount rates that were way too high, 5 to 10% too high. Uh, another way of looking at this is that investors' horizons were um, affected by short-termism. Um, and that the short-termism was increasing through time. Um, and five, 5 to 10% extra interest rate in the interest rate environment we have at the moment, where the US government can borrow at negative interest rates, inflation protected, uh, is a big number. In effect, what this says is that it's almost impossible to make uh, productive investments pay back. So discounted cash flow doesn't really work in practice. But actually, the news is worse than that because discounted cash flow doesn't even work in theory. This is work by uh, Doyne Farmer of the Santa Fe Institute and John Giancopoulos of Yale, uh, where they point out that uh, this, is, this, is, this is complex, and I'm not claiming that I fully understand it. This is my explanation of what, what's going on. So by assuming a single constant interest rate into the future, the uh, computation never sees periods of very low interest rates, like now, or periods of very high interest rates. And this would be fine if the outcome was linearly connected to the interest rate, but it's not. And so what, uh, what Farmer and Giancopoulos showed was that by changing from having a constant interest rate to having a bounded random walk in interest rate space, they could change the outcome in terms of the um, future, the, the net present value of some future cost from being very small to being infinite. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this is a real problem. What, that, what this says is that you can't do discounted cash flow calculations. What you have to do is to run a Monte Carlo simulation where you track uh, um, the, the, the path of your system through um, a, a, a suitable distribution in interest rate space. Um, so, that's what we've been building. Uh, uh, what we've done is to build a, um, a, a, a simulation environment which includes a number of aspects of long-term storage and it includes uh, various interest rate simulations as well. Um, so we have yield curves which are, relate the term of loans to the, the inflation protected interest rate on, on that loan. We have loans. Uh, we have assets. Um, endowment need, starts out with an asset and the asset earns interest while you don't spend it. And we have technologies uh, so each technology has you know, a purchase cost model. Um, for disks, it might be a purchase cost model that follows Crider's law. Um, it has a running cost, so for cloud storage, for example, this would be the rental cost for the space plus the bandwidth plus the compute cost for doing the necessary integrity checks and so on. Uh, then it has a move-in cost. So for cloud storage, for example, this might be the bandwidth cost of uploading the data to get it into the cloud in the first place. And similarly, a move out cost uh, for moving out when you're, when, when you're done. So the, the cost of migrating between one technology and the next is the move out cost of the old technology plus the move in cost of the, 
of the new technology, and it has um, a service life. And if the model chooses to deploy this technology, there's a purchase loan which pays for the purchase and the migration costs. And the, the uh, duration of the loan is the service life of the, of the technology, and um, the interest rate comes from the interest rate model. So how does it work? Uh, well, each year it sets the yield curve. Um, and the way I do it at the moment is it starts at a random year in the past 30-year history of interest rates uh, and then runs time forward and backwards and forward and backwards through this 30-year um, um, history. Um, then each year we, we, the model generates some new technologies with different pricing and, and running costs and so on. Uh, and then for each technology I'm currently using, it runs the hardware upgrade process to decide whether to um, upgrade from the old technology to some new technology, and it um, does the accounting for the running costs and the loan costs and so on, and deals with the fact that you may have borrowed money for five years to buy some technology and then decided after three years to replace it with something else, but you still have to carry on paying the the, the loan for the remaining two years. Um, and this is the, the hardware upgrade process. One of the really surprising things so far about this model is that um, this is, um, even this is not complicated enough to model real decisions in this area. Uh, it's, um, I was amazed at how complicated this was. And I can already see that it doesn't actually model the way people really think about this. Um, you have both a, a, a service life and a planning horizon. This is, this is in effect, where the Bank of England's short-termism come comes in, because you can buy... I mean, suppose you can buy a technology that has a 20-year service life. You're not actually going to commit at the time you buy to using that technology for its full 20 years because who the hell knows what's going to happen in, in, in 20 years. You're going to think, well, I need this to make economic sense in some time a lot less than 20 years, like, say, seven years maybe. So there's a planning horizon and there's a service life. Uh, and uh, if your, the technology, the old technology is at the end of its service life, then you, you have to replace it irrespective. Otherwise, you need to compute the cost of keeping the old technology over the shorter of its service life and the planning horizon. And then for each new technology, you need to compute the cost of the new technology over the planning horizon. And if it's cheaper, then you replace it. Uh, and the cheaper has to include the migration costs. Uh, OK, so this is, this is where we start showing graphs. Um, this is assuming Crider's law is observed faithfully and storage costs drop exactly 25% every year, and running costs represent two th uh, the running costs are set so that they represent two-thirds of the total cost of um, ownership. And this uses the Treasury's interest rate database from 1990 to 2010. And the question that we're asking is, uh, as we increase the endowment that we um, deposit with the data, what's the probability of the data surviving um, 100 years? And as you see, up to about 5.7 times the uh, original cost of the storage, the probability is zero. You're going to run out of money sometime in the in the 100 years. And once you get past that, the probability rises pretty quickly to something around 6.5%, where it gets to be effectively 100%. And what this really tells you is that if disk drives, uh, if storage costs are dropping 25% a year, then the random variation in interest rates doesn't have a big effect on the uh, size of the endowment that you need. Um, so this is the result of, uh, I think, 10,000 
runs of, of simulation. So this is the result of about half a million runs of the simulation, where we are looking at, we're doing that same computation for uh, a whole set of different um, Crider's law rates of, of decrease between 5% and 40% a year. And the, um, the, the sort of plateau at the top is where things survive, and the, the sort of skirt at the bottom is where things are pretty much guaranteed not to survive. Uh, and the, the slope in between is, um, is, where the, the, is where the interest rate is actually affecting things. So we take the 98% contour on that, and we get this graph, which is, shows the, um, the, the size of the, um, uh, the which shows the, the uh, rate of decrease of, of storage costs and the uh, associated endowment that you need to get a 98% probability of surviving 100 years. So you can see, um, it, as, the, the, as the rate at which storage costs drop uh, increases, the endowment you need falls pretty rapidly and then flattens out, which is pretty much what we'd expect. But it's still pretty expensive. I mean, we're talking varying between 14 times the, the co basic cost of the storage and five times. Uh, so this, this is what I've been working on in the last couple of weeks, which is so... There are, I, I went through all these reasons why Crider's Law might not continue to work in the medium term, but actually what happened was there were these historic floods in Thailand which submerged most of the factories that build disk drives, and disk drive prices doubled in a few weeks. Uh, so, obviously, if this model was going to be any use, I had to be able to simulate the effect of spikes in the... Uh, in the cost of storage. Uh, so this is modeling uh, what happens if uh, one year the cost of storage doubles and then drops back over a two-year period and resumes its, its decline. Uh, so the, the curve at the, at the front of this graph is the curve from the previous one showing what's the effect of no spikes and then succeeding ones behind it show the effect of, a, of this spike one year after you start, two years after you start, three years after you start, and so on. And you'll see that uh, if disk drive costs, if, if storage costs are dropping rapidly, spikes have very little effect. Uh, if they're not dropping rapidly, spikes can have a really big effect. Um, and the other thing you notice is that there's kind of a ridge in the, in the surface at... Um, four years. And the, the reason for this is that there's assumption here is that storage has a four-year service life. And if you're unlucky enough to have the disks, the, the storage costs spike double exactly at the time when your current storage is obsolete and has to be replaced, you lose. <laughs> Whereas if the spike happens um, while you still have time left on your current investment in storage, you lose much less. Okay, so other uses of the model. Well, one of the things we can look at is what's the effect of short-termism? How, how long a planning horizon should we really be using? And what's the cost of using a planning horizon that's much shorter than we need to? Uh, that's an interesting question. We haven't, I haven't managed to run enough simulations to um, look at this yet. Uh, then there's this whole question that we were looking at with the, the Dawn architecture. In other words, um, how much lower do the running costs have to be to make it affordable to pay X times as much for uh, the, the storage up front in order to get the lower running costs? And there's the local disk versus cloud storage question, comparing something which has purchase costs plus running costs with running costs only, and looking at things, questions like, you know, so, okay, so how fast has uh, the cost of cloud storage actually been dropping? Um, there are a lot. 
of obvious um, improvements to this, this simulation. Uh, we need better models of interest rates. Um, we need much better models of technology evolution than simply um, plugging in different numbers for Crider's law. Uh, we need to be able to do better at investing the endowment than investing it in um, one-year treasuries, which is what the assumption is at the moment. Um, we need a better model of decision-making around upgrading the hardware. And we, the goal is to implement this thing as a, as, a, uh, a, as a website where people can go and play what-if games to, um, for scenario planning purposes. And um, in, in order to do this, um, we're putting together a team um, at UC Santa Cruz and, and SUNY Stony Brook to uh, work on this problem. And um, what I'm looking for is, is feedback. Uh, you know, does this look like this could be useful for you? Uh, what other concepts does it need? I mean, obvious ones that we have already come up are um, replication policies. At the moment, we're looking at one unit of storage, um, but clearly, you need to have copies on multiple units of storage, and you should really be organizing things so that you don't upgrade all the copies of your uh, valuable content at the same time. <laughs> um, and then there's the, the, the real question that people want to know is, is connecting these cost models to reliability models. And that's going to be really hard. So uh, I've left plen plenty of time for questions, so I'll turn it over to you. Wow, this is great. Thank you very much. Um, um, you know, as we try to sort of struggle with how much should things cost, uh, this is uh, going to be really helpful to, uh, I think, all universities. A um, couple of things. Uh, you, you have data growth up there. I was wondering about um, there must be some kind of increments in which uh, uh, once your data uh, exceeds certain sizes, then things will sort of jump. Have you been modeling that at, at all? Uh, I mean, like the, the two terabyte to, to three terabyte, um, you know, sort of uh, a jump would, would probably make a difference. Um, and, and, and then secondly, uh, you had a 70x uh, um, number in, uh -huh. in when you were des describing, describing the Princeton. Where did that come from? Oh, okay. I, I can explain both of those. Um, so the, the, the um, step functions in, in technology are, uh, are actually in the model. I haven't been oh, okay. using them at the moment because um, uh, it's actually uh, just getting to this point has been quite a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to choose some really simple examples that I could explain to people yeah. so that they, they could connect what they were seeing in the graph to their expectations. And, um, putting in step changes in the in the technology turns the, the little I've done of it so far produces some rather strange looking graphs, um, which I'm still trying to understand. So uh, I, I haven't done that. The seventy the the seventy times number came from using the assumption that Amazon's um, storage pricing would decline twenty percent a year and looking at what it would cost to fund indefinite preservation by buying the 11.9's S3 service and comparing it with what it would cost to, to, to um, buy that from the, the, using the 4.9's service. Right. Um, and uh, that struck me as an interesting number, but the more interesting one would be to look at what it would cost uh, to um, uh, once we get replication policies in there, because obviously you need more replicas at the, at the four, uh, in the four nine service than you do in the eleven nine service. So, and the reason for the eleven nine service costing more is that am underneath it, Amazon has more replicas, right? So uh, <laughs> there's, there's a, a question about you're trying to investigate how Amazon is setting those prices, right. and um, it's not at all obvious. One really um, valuable thing for, for something we're working at, uh, on right now is trying to figure out 
um, what are the storage uh, terms? So if a, if a scientist says, okay, you must keep my data for 10 years mm -hmm. versus 20 years, yes. if, if your model would be very helpful to help us yeah. sort of work we, through we, some of those issues. Yes, we, 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 the varying duration is built into the model. Everything I've been doing this, on, on, in this talk uses 100 years as the target survival. Uh, but that's, again, just so I didn't have to explain too much um, in, in, in all in one go. <laughs> My memory from the discussion last year was that one of the more powerful arguments was that staffing wasn't really accounted for in the Goldstein uh, argument. Did, mm -hmm. you, did you look at human attention time and institutional staffing? Uh, that's in, in this model, it's buried in running costs. And uh, the, right now, the model assumes that running costs, in effect, that the, that the running cost is a per drive um, cost, not a per byte cost. So it goes down as the capacity of the drive as a constant cost uh, increases. Now, uh, that's probably not a good assumption, um, but that Fortunately, that is one of the one of the pieces where the model is capable of modeling that. I just haven't messed with those parameters. <laughs> uh, there are, there's one of the reasons why I'm looking at this and saying there's way more work here than I can do is that there, there, even in its current rather simplistic form, there are a whole lot of parameters in here to explore the parameter space of and um, running. I, I mean, even with um, relatively fast machines running uh, uh, half a million runs of the simulation takes a few hours. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for this. It's really uh, be really interesting to keep tracking this as you progress. I was glad you mentioned environmental shocks, and I would just throw out that you also have, uh, it's probably obvious to you, but political shocks, mm -hmm. local environmental shocks, wars, organizational shocks, that sort of thing. And also, if, um, if you're only using the interest rate years from 1990 to 2010, you have fiscal shocks like 1982 and that sort of thing, you might want to include uh, yeah, that wild the, range. Yes. Uh, the, as, the, as, a, as I say, we need a better interest rate model. The reason for choosing um, um, the past 20 years is that that data is available straight right. from the Treasury's website in, right. on their um, inflation-protected uh, uh, yield curve right. database. Um, which made it really easy, <laughs> but right. uh, clearly we need a better model. Um, right. I was also glad that you mentioned the, the possibility of differential retention schedules, and it, something that might be really useful in the long-term planning concept, uh, uh, to use this model for long-term planning, is to think about uh, factoring retention models in. Yeah. Looking at, well, what, what, what's the cost if we assume that 99% of this data we're just going to be able to throw out in the next 99 years, and only 1% of it we're really going to need to keep. Maybe there's a 30-year model that's the yeah, life of this researcher with this 10 more years at this institution and 20 years into retirement, and then maybe we turn it off. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I'm being completely serious. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, my impression <laughs> is that the staff cost involved in figuring out what to throw away is is probably lower than the cost of cost of keeping it, um, but there there is one, once we get to replication policies, there is there's there's some interesting things we could investigate. So that so for example, um, you could gradually uh, decrease the number of replicas that right. you were keeping of stuff through time, right? Um, because uh, recent data is more heavily used than, than very old data. On the other hand, clearly there are some things like you know, databases of observations and so on for which you don't want to do that. Um, and then again, there's this whole business with, with um, gene sequencing where it turns out to be cheaper to resequence the genes than to keep the data, so. <laughs> right. Thanks. Uh, but there's, uh, this is, these are good questions. I'm actually re um, remembering some of this for, for notes about what we should be doing. Hi. Uh, I've been wondering when I would first hear the term used, uh, digital data storage futures. Uh, it kind of sounds like that's probably where we're going. Uh, I, yeah. But <laughs> I'll leave well, that aside. We, that was, we, we, I, uh, yes, uh, and derivatives of um, yeah. futures on data storage and so on. And yes, I, I'm sure that 
that we can just ignore the fact that the computational basis for these things has just been disproved to uh, find out how useful they are. <laughs> when I first saw uh, your list of assumptions about the, the cost of storage, and it occurred to me that I, I wondered uh, if you are thinking about what may be a much more complex issue, which is the cost of curation. Um, that is, you're talking about, it sounds to me like it, all these assumptions are based on uh, a, a model that only contemplates bit preservation. Uh, yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, clearly, um, the cost of keeping the data around once it's been ingested is typically something like um, half the cost of doing the ingestion, even using these fairly um, large values for how much you need to endow the data with. Um, the, uh, there are numbers from the Arts and Humanities Data Service, for example, which would suggest uh, that, that between a half, um, some, somewhere around a, a, a half to uh, two thirds um, numbers for those. But uh, I'm not sure if I understood what you were just describing. So if you look at the overall cost of digital preservation, um, ingest is the biggest cost. Uh, essentially, uh, I mean, if you assume that we're going to that storage costs are going to decrease by some amount over time, you end up seeing that uh, for essentially infinite storage, in ingest is typically still the biggest cost. So you've paid more than half the total amount you're going to pay up front, even if you rent the storage forever. My question has to do with the costs associated with uh, logical reformatting. The you know the that preservation. Where you yeah, say, okay. I'm, I'm, PDFA is you know okay. Yeah. That's great. Well, through a, okay, a I'm, I'm twenty on, years. I, I'm on record as believing that that, that those costs are nil because those uh, migrations aren't going to happen. I'm sorry, they're not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole different discussion. But the the um, if you want if you believe in in migration you can fold the, the cost of migration into the um, running costs or into the move in, move out costs. Uh, there's a different, that, that's, that's something that the model will cope with. The uh, upfront cost of ingest is not something that this model is set up to deal with. That was the point I was trying to make. I see, I yeah. see. So I ongoing curation costs you can fold into the running cost of the storage for the purposes of this, you know, to, to some extent, hand-waving simulation. Um, but we're not dealing with the upfront cost of getting it in there in the first place. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> um, hello, David. Um, so have you found any way to test your Monte Carlo simulations against past stuff? I have actually written Monte Carlo simulations a long yeah. time ago. And I was always expected to test it against past situations in order to, to validate it. But I, I wouldn't know where to start, but I'm wondering if you've thought about it. Uh, testing would be um, a rather grand uh, way of describing what we've done. Uh, we have, uh, th there isn't a lot of data to compare it with. Uh, the, the best numbers we have are, are the San Diego Supercomputer Center numbers. And um, we've produced some graphs that look something like the San Diego Supercomputer Center's numbers. Um, but that involves a lot of uh, rather hand-waving adjustment of parameters. Uh, so I wouldn't, um, uh, I wouldn't put too much uh, faith in, in them yet. Uh, I think this is more valuable at the moment in terms of um, getting people to think through the issues than actually making numerical projections. <laughs> uh, I think it's going to take quite a bit more work before we get to the point where you could actually Mm, place some 
some credibility in the numbers, that, in the specific numbers that were coming out, rather than the generic shape of the graphs. We, we need to get to uh, having confidence in, the, in that the shape of the graphs is, is plausible uh, before actually trying to move the graphs up and down so that the numbers agree with reality. <laughs> um, but I agree, there's, there, I mean, the thing you know about Monte Carlo simulations is that um, they, w w the more parameters you feed into them, the bigger the spread of results that you, you get out of them, and um, the less meaningful they become. Uh, so we need to be we need to be careful about that too. So yes, I, as I say, very much work in progress. Um, don't don't place too much credibility in the numbers because after all, you know the the biggest factor over over the initial storage cost that's coming out of the graphs at the moment is 14 times, which is half as much as Princeton's charging. So uh, the the numbers clearly need some need some manipulation. Kevin. Uh, thanks very much for that really interesting uh, presentation. I'm struck, you, you said um, that e even just running a few of these simulations actually takes up quite a lot of resources. And, and I imagine there's a lot of other people that would be willing uh, to help on this and, and indeed effectively to replicate the experiments, the simulation experiments that you've been conducting or to play with the parameters that you're not interested in. I wonder whether there's any scope uh, for that, but also I'm thinking about some of the uh, the questions, the other concepts that, that that people might want to put in there, and, and coping with uncertainty and allowing different people to have different risk models strikes me as, as one of the things that's possible. So, for instance, when you talked mm -hmm. about the decision points that come in the model, where a new technology emerges and and you have to decide, do I want to move to this new technology that uses, looks mm -hmm. cheaper, or do I mm -hmm. stick with the one that I've got? I can see that one of the things that some people will take into account there is new technology looks cheaper, but there's a greater error bar effectively on what its long-term right. cost will be. And I don't like uncertainty, so I'll stick with the thing that looks more expensive but is more certain. And, yeah. and whether you can model yeah. that as well. Yeah, <laughs> nobody got fired for buying IBM parameter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, I, I'm actually... Talking to um, Carol Goebel's team at Manchester about the possibility of taking this simulation and formulating it as one of their um, workflows, so that um, every, everybody can can play with it. Uh, and um, I'm going back there in January to um, talk to them some more about that. Right now, uh, I, Right now, the code is in kind of a shaky state, I have <laughs> to say. Um, and people who know my code know that if I say it's in a shaky state, it is in a really shaky state. But um, I'm hoping that the collaboration with the guys at, at UC Santa Cruz and, and Stony Brook will um, take my code and turn it into something a little more um, usable in, in a production sense. Um, so, uh, I'm, we're hoping to have something together um, sometime late spring, maybe, um, and uh, uh, stay tuned, because the, definitely our goal is to take these ideas and get them out there where people can play with them and um, look at, because as I say, the, the, the parameter space to explore is just enormous. Yeah. and. Um, it's way more than we can do on our own. Okay, well, it's great news that you're talking to Carol then. And I, I'm, I'm, I hope something comes off that. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Okay, thank you all very much. They were really good questions. <laughs> <laughs>